Shalom, I'm Brother Rael from Reunited Soul, and in this video, I'm going to discuss Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verses 1 through 8. To everything there is a season, with my key focus being on a season for war. So, let us nourish our soul with scripture that we may reunite with the Most High, the Elohim of Yahzrael. All scriptures will be read verbatim from the King James Version Bible. Now, let's get right into it. Let's start this discussion with Ecclesiastes chapter 3 verses 1 through 8, and I read, To everything there is a season, and a time to every purpose under the heaven, a time to be born, and a time to die, a time to plant, and a time to pluck up that which is planted, a time to kill, and a time to heal, a time to break down, and a time to build up, a time to weep, and a time to laugh a time to mourn, and a time to dance, a time to cast away stones, and a time to gather stones together, a time to embrace, and a time to refrain from embracing, a time to get, and a time to lose, a time to keep, and a time to cast away, a time to render, and a time to sow, a time to keep silence, and a time to speak, a time to love, and a time to hate, a time of war, and a time of peace. A time of war. Could it be on the horizon? Our people are no strangers when it comes to fighting and war. Being descendants of the tribe of Yehuda, we come from a good warrior stock, from great warriors such as King David. We've been fighting and dying on a daily basis ever since our ancestors arrived here on slave ships fighting on the home front for our freedom, and fighting in many wars abroad, fighting the enemies of our oppressors, and shortly after the smoke clears, those same people will immigrate over here to be elevated above us. Funny how that works. Our people have been called many things, but one thing we're not is cowardly. That's why I have a problem when I see more and more comments on social media questioning our brother's courage. Wanting to know why we're not retaliating when our people are murdered in the streets. It seems with every incident of our brothers and sisters being murdered with impunity, we're nudged closer and closer to an all-out conflict with the powers that be. People are angry, frustrated, and tired of the status quo of a one-sided justice system. This has been going on for the past 400 years. Nothing new under the sun, brothers and sisters. The real issue is that we get occasionally distracted into thinking that we're a free people, with equal rights and protection under the law, with the freedom to conduct business like any other immigrant group, free to live peacefully in any community that we choose, which lures us into a false sense of belonging until the next racially charged incident happens. Then the process is repeated. Nothing new under the suns, brothers and sisters. Nothing new under the sun. Now, depending on your perspective as to who you believe we are as a people, we can contemplate a course of action that we can take. There are many factions within our community with their belief systems predicting the outcome of our people's situation. To simplify it, there's a spiritual outlook and a worldly outlook as to what we should do as a people. Those who have a spiritual outlook believe that a higher authority, as in the Creator, is coming to deliver our people and judge our enemies. And within this group are various religious factions committed to their specific doctrines. You may find it challenging to get these groups to work together as a united front. With that being said, can you really expect them to fight effectively together? Now, there are those who have a worldly outlook that believe that there's no one coming to save us as a people that we're all that we have and it's up to us to take arms and defend ourselves against our enemies. Within this group are many factions committed to their specific lifestyles. For example, conservative lifestyles are not compatible with liberal lifestyles. 
Now, you may find it challenging to get these groups to work together as a united front. With that being said, can you really expect them to fight together effectively? So now you have an idea of how divided we are as a people and the chances of establishing a united front across the entire spectrum is not something you want to uh, gamble on. Because raging war is a gamble that requires you to put everything you have on the table. Winner takes all or whatever is not destroyed. Some of you may reason that if these groups don't have a choice, then they'll have to fight together. Well, I see two problems with that reasoning. First, a skillful enemy will always leave the choice for his opponent to submit to his terms instead of fighting. Second, wars are not won because you're forced to fight them or because you're angry and frustrated. Wars are won through commitment, strategy, and efficient execution of that strategy. Anyone willing to push people to war with no effective plan to win is either a fool or is going to profit from it in some way. Be careful, brothers and sisters, of the fools, sellouts, and profiteers who lead the sheep into the wolf's den. As the saying goes, all skin folk ain't kin folk. Always use wisdom, Yasrael. So, what are we supposed to do? I'm glad you asked that question. I'm going to discuss this in a way where our people can receive this, whether they're in the truth of who we are as a people or not in the truth. So, let me start with a question. Do you know what all vermin have in common? Now, when I say vermin, I'm speaking in terms of wild animals. Wolves, raccoons, rats, and so forth. What do all vermin have in common? They need to eat. And what attracts vermin to your property? A valuable food source. The bigger the food source, the greater the vermin infestation. Remove the food source, and they'll move on to somewhere else with a better food source. Now, what does this have to do with our people? Well, it's the same principle. We have predators in our communities with a hearty appetite for sheep. And we have a viable source in our communities for those predators. You think that our communities were five-star buffets the way they come in and eat with impunity. Remove the sheep and take away the food source. Stop being sheep. Try to be a ram instead. At least you'll have horns to defend yourself. Or you can strive to be a lion, which is the symbol of our people, the tribe of Yehuda, which some of you know as Judah. I know that Christianity will tell you being a sheep is a good thing because Jesus is the good shepherd. He will protect his sheep. Well, he may be a hell of a shepherd in heaven, but down here on earth, the wolves are not skipping any meals, if you know what I mean. You can't be a sheep down here, people, especially not in our communities. If you have too many sheep walking around your community, then you'll have an overpopulation of wolves. And as long as the sheep are plentiful, the wolves aren't going anywhere. So, what do I consider a sheep? I'm glad you asked that question. Sheep, in my opinion, is someone that's an easy target and ill-prepared to defend themselves. For example, someone who's easily provoked by an aggressor without considering what it takes to win the confrontation. Someone who's prone to commit misdemeanor violations where the law enforcement is all too eager to step in and escalate it into a felony conviction. Someone who's unaware of the type of people that's around them and have no idea they're in hostile territory. Someone who thinks law enforcement must enforce the law or protect their civil rights. A sheep is someone who has no regard for the image or progress of our people. Now the list goes on and on, but you get the gist of it. And again, in my opinion, that's the characteristics of a sheep. The bottom line is, a sheep will always need someone to intervene in the situation that they become involved in. 
So, as long as there's sheep to be eaten, the wolves are going to hunt and feed. It's as simple as that. Change sheepish behavior and the wolves will have to work harder for their meals. Remove the sheep altogether and the wolves will have to pack it up and go elsewhere to find their sheep. Somewhere where they can easily feed. We can't raise our children to be sheep. Our oppressors have built industries that profit from us being sheep. We help them put their children through college while they herd our children like sheep through their industries. When our oppressors enter our communities with ill intent, it shouldn't look like they're going into some harmless sheep farm or petting zoo. When they enter our communities, it should feel like they entered the lion's den. Remember, our people's symbol is the lion. So, if you're a sheep, strive to be a ram. Rams do defend themselves. And if you're a ram, then strive to be a lion. The Lion of Yehuda. Now, for those of you who know that you're a descendant of the transatlantic slave trade, that you are the most high's chosen people scattered to the four corners of the earth, the rest of this discussion pertains to you. Now, let's get right into it. Let's revisit Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 8. And I read, A time to love and a time to hate, a time of war and a time of peace. A time of war. Let's be clear. Our ancestors never went to war over pride. As a matter of fact, all throughout the Tanakh or the Old Testament scriptures, our ancestors fought many battles, but only fought for two reasons. First, they fought to take the land the Most High promised them. Second, they fought to defend the land the Most High promised them. That's it, brothers and sisters. The nation that cannot be destroyed fought for two reasons, and only for two reasons. It was related to the land, and of course, the Most High made good on His word regarding the land. And if we follow the example of David, the warrior king, he never went to war without approval from the Most High. He requested permission every time because when the Most High was with him, his enemy's destruction was certain. King David knew where his victories came from in times of war. If the Most High said, leave nothing alive, that's exactly what David did. Okay, so we're not in the land. We're actually in the land of our captivity. And yes, our people have bled many times over helping our oppressors fight their enemies. And yes, our people are still being murdered and mistreated. So, why are we being nudged in the direction to fight our oppressors? By our own people, mind you. There's a reason why this nation has not been defeated for the past 400 years. Our captivity cannot be disrupted. When the Most High say 400 years of affliction according to Genesis chapter 15 verse 13, he means 400 years of affliction. Let's go to it. Genesis chapter 15 verse 13 and I read. And he said unto Abram, Know of a surety that thy seed shall be a stranger in a land that is not theirs, and shall serve them, and they shall afflict them for 400 years. We shall serve them meaning they will rule over us and afflict us for 400 years. You can't change that, which means you're not just fighting our oppressor. You're fighting against the word of the Most High. He said 400 years of affliction and his word will not return to him void according to Isaiah chapter 55 verse 11 and I read. So shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth it shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereto I sent it. So, who are you really fighting against? Your oppressors or prophecy? Because they are connected. No, nah, brother. We're fighting for our freedoms. They can't treat us this way. You mean they shouldn't be afflicting us? Well, they've been doing it for the past 400 years, just as the Most High said they would. The good news is that it's almost over. 
deliverance is near. Did our ancestors have to fight an Egyptian bondage? No, not at all. The Most High handled that all by himself. Were our ancestors tired of serving the Egyptians? Of course they were. But our ancestors didn't have to raise a fist to the Egyptians. Well, Moshe did, but that was before he knew the Most High's plan. No, brother, you, you're reaching, brother, you're reaching. This, this is different. Our ancestors were mistreated and overworked in Egypt as well. Remember, they were killing the male infants in Egypt to reduce the population. That's how Moshe ended up in Pharaoh's palace. We can also follow our ancestors' lead in Babylonian captivity. Remember, King Nebuchadnezzar attempted to kill Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego by throwing them in the fiery furnace. Did they fight their way out of it? Did our ancestors protest, march in the streets, or call for a race war? No, not at all. As a matter of fact, when King Nebuchadnezzar witnessed the Most High's power and authority in the fiery furnace, he praised the Most High and made a decree to his people that he will put to death anyone that speak against the Most High. Let's go to it. The book of Daniel, chapter 3, verses 28 through 30, and I read, Then Nebuchadnezzar spake and said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who hath sent his angel and delivered his servants that trusted in him, and have changed the king's word, and yielded their bodies, that they may not serve nor worship any god except their own god. Therefore, I make a decree that every people, nation, and language which speak anything amiss against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be cut in pieces, and their houses shall be made a dunghill, because there is no God that can deliver after this sort. Then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. There you have it in Scripture. Those young brothers were promoted after all that. But can you imagine what would have transpired if our ancestors decided to rise up and fight the very nation the Most High empowered to enslave them? It wouldn't have ended well for our ancestors, to say the least. King Nebuchadnezzar would have slaughtered them. Now that was a predetermined 70-year captivity, by the way. Just like this captivity we're in today, a predetermined 400 years of being afflicted. Only the Most High can strip our oppressor from the power that he himself ordained for them to have for a specific period of time. It is what it is, Yasrael. The good news is that we as a people are awakening and preparations are currently being made for our deliverance. Open your eyes, brothers and sisters, and watch the power that binds our people fade as the Most High delivers his people out of captivity for the final time. It's been a long time coming. Let's not faint now. Let's not get impatient. Let's be lions instead of sheep. Let's keep it in line with the Most High's word. And as far as a season for war, if it doesn't involve the land promised to us, it's not wartime. It's that simple. To everything, there is a season and a time to every purpose under the heaven. In conclusion, our people, both men and women, have proven their courage in times of adversity time and time again. We may be called many things, but cowardly, never. With that being said, always keep your trust in the Most High. Love Him with all your heart with all your soul and with all your might. See to it that your household is in line with the word of the Most High as best you can. I thank you for taking the time to watch. Again, I am Rael, your reunited soul brother. And with that, I say to you, Shalom.